I've never seen a year over year change in sports like this. Our numbers are just way, way, way higher than last year. So from the moment that Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese particularly announced for the draft, our, our website went crazy and the women's team won gold. The women's three on three team with our Ryan Howard won bronze. So that, that it's not like we've just became irrelevant overnight. Like, but additionally, we have to make sure that we're outgrowing the rest of the league because all right, this is Colin Sala, a reporter with Front Office Sports' newsletter team. And we are joined by Dan Gad, the Senior Vice President for Growth with the WNBA's Atlanta Dream. Dan, thank you for joining us. Absolutely, Colin. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about, you know, previewing the WNBA, the second half of the WNBA season, which starts today. But before that, you guys had basically a month off as a front office exec. What does that break look like? Is that a break or is that working? So we, we, we did have, you know, obviously with the, with the growth of the league, we had a, a very, uh, a very busy first half of the year trying to really, I mean, honestly keep up with demand in some ways. And that, that added a lot to the play. So we did, we did get the, the whole staff a week off, which was fantastic. But outside of that, I will say like, we, we were not lacking for things to do while we were on break. We, we rolled out our 2025 renewals and, and, and new season tickets and, you know, we've still got a game coming up here at State Farm, which I'm sure we're going to talk about soon. And we just a number of initiatives going on. So we, we try to use that time as much as possible to catch up and, and get ahead of some things. But we were uh, we, we there was no lack of things for us to do during the break. I can only imagine. I mean, obviously, it was the Olympics. I hope you had time to watch. But Absolutely. of course, um, there's still a full a whole half of the season to go. And you already mentioned it here. You mentioned strong demand. Obviously, this year has been monumental for the WNBA. Um, but a lot, you know, it's it's not it's fair to say I think that a lot of it has come from yes growth over the last few years, but also this new rookie class. Um, and I'm curious on your side, you, you know, you you don't have a Caitlin Clark or an Angel Reese, but I'm sure you're still yeah. feeling these positive effects. Um, what is the visible proof that you've seen quantitatively or even qualitatively of that growth? Oh, without a doubt, like in every way, shape and form, this has been we, we refer to it a lot as a pattern breaking year. What I mean by that is from the moment that Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese particularly announced for the draft, like our our we do a very good job of data collection and, and, and trying to like make sure we reach out and, and capture the interest and, and follow that up with with, uh, you know, season ticket offers and things like that. And from the minute that they declared for the draft. Our, our website went crazy and, and the number of leads coming in was fantastic. So, you know, yeah, you can point to some games where the ceiling has gone, you know, unbelievably high on some of these games, but additionally, like from a season ticket base, you know, this past year, we sold out of season tickets for the first time in franchise history and, and had to cap it because there were some other things that we wanted to do. And uh, that allowed us to start a, a waiting list and allowed us to really, really give us a lot of options on, on things that we wanted to do in the back half of the year. Um, but, but to your point, yeah, like additionally, like now we've got these, these games that just have tremendous, tremendous demand. And so that's been a lot of, you know, a lot of what we did during the break was, was really forecasting 2025 and figuring out how do we now play in this new kind of atmosphere where you we're really looking at like almost four tiers of games and, and what flexibility do we have to build in going into next year? So, so without a doubt, it's had a huge impact on the league. Additionally, you know, TV ratings are, are really, really high just general awareness of the league is much higher than it was. And it's great for us to, to, to have these, even if it's not us playing in the games, having these big TV games and driving more awareness. But additionally, you know, we, we also renegotiated a, a media deal here locally because the teams all do their own media deals. And uh, we have great partners in Peachtree TV here. And our, our numbers are just way, way, way higher than last year. So, you know, we, this has been a three-year growth process for us. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So this isn't just one year. We've we've really had tremendous growth, starting really with the the new ownership group coming in in 2021, and then going into 2022, really having to be able to staff up and and do some things differently to drive awareness in the market. And so I'll talk more about this later. But we this has been like really year three or four of what has been a, a, a very very strong growth rate. And and but this has definitely been different. And just you know. Just anecdotally, I've worked in sports for a very long time. I've worked at three NFL teams. I've never seen a year-over-year -year change in sports like this, and 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 how to handle and how to handle that's been one of the biggest questions. So it's it has been a phenomenal year with a lot of great problems to solve. A lot to to pick apart there, and I'm excited to talk about more. Um, 
the one thing that really stood out to me was talking about historical data and talking mm-hmm. about how you've never seen something like this. You worked for NFL teams. I'm I'm so curious because you do handle tickets, sponsorships, marketing. Mm-hmm. A lot of that is looking at historical data and saying, hey, this is what we have. This is what we can do for you. Now that you're projecting to 2025 or, 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 what, or even this year, how do you handle those? Like, what, what historical data are you showing that, 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 they'll, that they'll look at? Uh, how long do you have? Uh, we, so like I said, we, we, we are always very data driven and, and we, it's not, we base you know, it just solely on the data, but we want the data to be, to be a major, major criteria and make sure that we have a reason to believe that our decisions are right. So we have been, uh, we've put data and collection of data and, and analyzing you know, trends at the forefront of what we do, but we've, we've never gone through a process like we did uh, recently in the last several weeks in terms of trying to forecast 2025 and figure out, you know, and we had to calculate, you know, probably more so than ever before, like where is the line on supply and demand? And right. So you've got these now we're, we're right now playing two games this season at state farm arena, which massively increases the, the amount of inventory, but we're now having to look, how does that, how do those two games at state farm impact the balance of our other games at home and the flexibility in terms of, you know, like I said, the, you've got these, these, now really high demand games that also have a lot of seats and they, they sit on the market for longer. And so there's just, there's a lot more time and effort, even from a marketing standpoint to get those games, you know, into a good spot and sold out and to maximize, you know, the, not just the revenue, but the fan growth that we can get from those games, getting new buyers into the arena. And again, what, what impact is that having on the rest of our slate? So we had to look at everything from, you know, making sure that our season ticket members remain happy about the decisions that we make this year and looking at the overall supply and demand and that we didn't outpace that next year because we all of a sudden had a glut of inventory out there and, and on and on and on. And so we, we looked at everything from we went back really from 2019 through this year and looked at, at the, the year over year, what would be kind of the traditional growth rates in the league, what happened this year. Um, And then we looked at it on a team by team basis, because one of the other things that we have to do is we have to make sure and uh, there's a reason for this. I'll get to in a second, but we have to make sure that we're outgrowing the rest of the league, because to be frank, our our ownership group inherited, you know, a situation that was really at a deficit compared to the rest of the league in in 2021. And so every year, one of the things that we've had to really benchmark is, are we outgrowing the rest of the league? And we've been able to do that. And so, you know, kind of going back to that, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, for instance, is since 2019, we've. Our, our full season ticket revenue has grown about 500%. And the rest of the league is, has had tremendous growth as well, but they're, they're about half of that. So we've about doubled the, the league um, growth revenue from a ticket sales perspective, but we've had to do that because of where we were starting in 2021, 2022. Uh, but the, a lot of good news, you know, this year, bringing it back to this year, you know, yesterday, we just doubled our uh, last, last 2023 had been our record season ticket revenue or overall ticket revenue. We just doubled that yesterday for 2024. So we've been able to keep this thing moving through, you know, a lot of work on the, to your point, like knowing the numbers around the league, knowing the growth trends, knowing what our supply and demand was, knowing what ticket prices, it's not, it's not just a calculation of ticket prices, but that does factor into it as well, but also like, you know, flexibility and like how many seats are available for each of these games. And, you know, are we looking at different venues to get to take advantage in, of some of these higher demand games? So all of that went into it um, and it was a long, long process. But I think we came out of it, came out of it with a really, really strong approach for 2025. Yeah, that sounds, again, congratulations to the, to the growth that you guys are experiencing. I think congratulations to you guys and the league right now for what's going on. I want to talk about sponsorships. I want to talk about venues, but I'll, I'll pull back a little bit because we're talking about 2025. I want to look at the, the, this next half of the year um, and what's what's happening for the, the rest of the year because, of, of course, it's, it's not all the time that you see this long break and lull mm-hmm. in, the, in the middle of the year. Do you think that's going to have any effect? How are you guys projecting that potential effect, especially not just because there's a break, but also because, you know, fall sports season is starting for other, you know, leagues? I am not worried about a break in momentum. I'll put it that way. Um, we, I'm not losing any sleep over that. We, you know, we, the, the women's team won gold, the women's three on three team with our Ryan Howard won bronze. So that, that it's not like we've just became irrelevant overnight. Like that, that all, you know, helps with everything that, that we have for the back half of the year. But additionally, you know, from our side, we're getting a, a really a, a in the first half of the year, we had very, very significant injuries. So with Jordan Canada, Ryan Howard and others, we're going to, for the first time coming out of the break, we're going to have a full healthy lineup. 
and that is a lot of reason. So we're right on the cusp of the playoff um, seating, and that's that should give us a lot of momentum here. So we have the back half of the stretch, a playoff run with a healthy lineup, and we're going to be playing our best basketball. And oh, by the way, we've also sold out our first 13 games, and we're trying to close in on closing up the selling out the final seven to get to 20 for 20 for sellouts. So we're we're not we're not concerned at all about a lack of momentum. We see a lot of opportunity, and like, as I mentioned, you know the TV ratings are significantly better this year. And I, I think the Olympics are, you know, you look at how this started, it really started with the momentum of women's college basketball, right? There were some great things that happened there. So, so having an Olympic break, I don't think hurt us at all. Cause again, the women team, the women's team winning gold does not, is, is, is a good thing for us as well. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I agree. I, I see that there's, there's that opportunity, especially because again, unprecedented what's going on right now. It's so hard to compare it to past data, but I will, and I will look at that and ask you, has in the past there been, you know, when when the NFL comes back, because a lot of the playoff games, for example, are played on Sundays and then you have NFL Sunday uh, or mm -hmm. college football Saturday, right? Has there been an effect that you've seen in terms of whether it's, you know, viewership or tickets um, when that time comes? I know you're not worried about it now, but has that happened in the past? Are, are you saying directly us compared to the NFL? Yeah, or or any like whenever these all these other leagues come in, I guess um, is there like a, a kind of a cannibalism that happens um, in in terms of whether it's viewership or ticket sales? You know, I, again, like that's not something I lose sleep over. You know, if you go back to you know, again, we're going to have our playoff run. You know, up, headed up right face to face with the NFL as well, or head to head with the NFL games in the regular season. But you know, we had you know, once in a generation ratings on last year's WNBA finals with two great teams. And, you know, I, I, as the WNBA, I think we just have to focus on continuing for our own growth. Uh, we have to get better every year. And, and I have every reason to believe that we're going to do that. Even as the NFL starts, you know, we, we were head to head with them last year. And, you know, I, there's reason to believe that this year's numbers will be even better regardless of, you know, the NFL starting up. Right. And, and that was a great finals last year, pitting two really dominant teams. But one of the things that the league has going for it this year is now you've got a couple of players on some of those other teams that will likely be in the playoffs. So you are still going to have these, you know, some super teams in there, but now you've also got a little more depth, I think, in terms of some of the games and some of the teams that are going to draw viewership. So I think if you look at the playoffs overall, um, and, I, and I think we're right there in, in that mix, like it's, it should be a very exciting end of the year. And there should, there's a lot of optimism about, you know, what the, the, the growth and viewership that we're going to have throughout that process. Yeah. Now let's let's shift gears. Like it's it's nice to see that you know the outlook for the rest of the year is at least in your opinion is going to be positive um, as it has been all year. Um, I want to go to that. You, you mentioned venues. You, you've played a couple of games, um, and and I, I I'm curious. Like, what's the thought process now? Like you mentioned, in terms of are you looking at playing outside? Are you looking at bigger venues down the line, especially as you know the the league continues to grow. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, you know, we'll, we haven't landed on an exact number yet. There's a couple other factors that we need to see, and we're, we're still talking through all of this. But we definitely, you know, there's, like I said, there's a number of factors that we're, we're factoring. And one of them is pricing, you know, supply and demand is, it comes into play there, growth trends. But part of it is the availability of seats. And so there's a couple, there, if you're being flexible and you're looking at all of those different factors, you know, you don't have to just go in and incredible and raise prices, you know, all, all over the place. When we have the ability to partner with somebody like the Hawks and there's other potential options in town too. So we can, we can increase the number of seats available and just doing that in a way that doesn't like then damage, you know, some of the other games that we have. So we're, we're absolutely considering that. Um, we don't have a, a final number right now. I think we're going to we'll probably wait. And there's a couple, like I said, there's a couple kind of touch point moments coming up that we're going to evaluate what the landscape looks like. And one of those, you know, I'm not afraid to say is the schedule release, like being able to know what our, what our 22 game slate looks like next year and, and start to match, you know, the demand to, to the right game. So, but absolutely we, we are, you know, we, we play in a, in a, in an arena that offers us a fantastic fan experience right now. And it is the best tool that we have for growing fans. It is, it is loud. It is a, it is a party vibe in there every game. And that has been the one thing that's really become the center of our marketing efforts is get people to their first game because that thing turns people into fans. So it's been fantastic for us, but yeah, in the current state, we have to open up inventory and find other options to get, to get more fans in there to continue to grow at the same rates that we have. So, so we will absolutely consider that. 
now I want to talk about sponsorships. Take me into your into a, a a conversation with a with a potential sponsor right now compared to where it was, you know, maybe two years ago. Yeah, you know, Layla Brock and, and our sponsorship team and our corporate partnership team do a fantastic job on that side, and and they are they are you know first of all, I think they the growth story of the WNBA is a big part of it, but also you know showcasing the value that we offer to those partners is huge, and so that's a um, that's a conversation that they lead, but our whole organization is involved in it too, and. I'll be honest that, you know, if you look at, again, that is going to be one of the more fascinating things, I think, across the league. There's a number of things next year that I'm curious to see, you know, what, what's going to happen. But one of the biggest things is, you know, the biggest questions is how do you continue to increase the number of assets to sell to these partners or to, to, to put them on that are both valuable for them and work for our continued growth as well? So it works for both sides. And so that's a that's a big conversation. But our, our team is doing a phenomenal job of being true partners and finding true partners. And, and it's, I think it's, it's a much simpler conversation now when, when everybody sees the momentum. Um, but, but we have a great story here in Atlanta and making sure that they understand that and understand how we can help them connect to the city is a, is a huge part of that as well. So it is, um, I'm not in every single one of those conversations, but I am a lot in a lot with, with Layla and, and a bunch of others on our team. So, uh, it, it is, it has been a really fun year. And, and again, it's, an, it's, there are a lot of, there's a lot of things happening at once and having to solve for all of them is, is a, has been a fun challenge. You know, one of the big things that also happened over this, um, break, like very early, very soon after the break started was the, the media rights deal, the national media rights deal that was signed mm -hmm. by the NBA with its three new partners. And then obviously the WNBA is looped into that deal. This obviously, you mentioned the local media rights deal earlier, but this one is the national one. When when you're looking at that, what was your reaction and how does that affect, you know, one singular franchise like, like the Dream? Yeah, that's a great question and a hugely, hugely important piece for the league. And really, there, there were a couple things that immediately, you know, you want to go see, especially somebody in my position, you want to see is number one, does it raise the floor? Does it, does it? meet where we are right now and, and raise the value of the entire league and, and, and generate the type of revenue, to be frank, that, that we think we deserve and with the right partners, right? So that we're getting the right visibility and, and continuing to grow this thing. And then number two, when you, when you talk about an 11 year deal, you know, the next thing you wanna know is, hey, does it give the flexibility for us to reevaluate as we go and, and account for the growth of the league? If we continue to grow at this rate, right? That thing could have become obsolete pretty fast. So, so this one does after three years, it gives us the ability to reevaluate that. So those two factors in my book were, were, uh, were very strong. And, and so that, that's great. And then, you know, I think a lot of things that don't get talked about enough is there's other media rights to sell. There, there's still room for uh, additional partners to come on board. And, you know, again, working on the team side, it, it just as important for us is who's that media partner for us and what does that look like for us? And, and are we, are we continuing to grow the viewership in our own market on our local games? And so when you look at it as part of that whole framework, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a strong deal and, it, and it, it's going to great. It, it allows us to, to, to both raise the bar right now and continue to grow over time. And, and that's all you can ask for. I got one long-term question for you, Dan. We've been talking about, the next two months we've been talking about 2025 yeah i think it's hard to project for three years from now but i'm going to ask you that question anyway where where do you see the dream and the wnba in three five years yeah let me let me start by just kind of painting what what has happened here this these past three years um you know we we're coming off of you know in 2022 when a lot of this group was hired and started really running um there was, there was really very little benchmarks to go off of. We were really kind of in a new arena, but there, there, you know, if you looked at where we were at the bottom of all of these metrics within the league, we, we knew we had a lot of work to do. And, and a lot of it was just growing the fan base. Like we had to drive more awareness and we had to, you know, I'll say compete in the entertainment landscape a little bit. And I think that's a big thing about going forward. And, and, um, but I think that this, you know, this ownership group has given us the resources to do that. We've built up, I think, a very strong team here. Um, and, and, you know, we went from eight sellouts, which was remarkable in 2022 to 12 in 2023, which again was remarkable considering what we had seen of this team before that. And then, and then this year, right now we're, we've got a legitimate shot of selling out all, all 20 and we're working very hard to try and do that. So, so to, to to kind of like talk about where it's going. I think 
I think the biggest thing is right now we're at an inflection point of what the of what the whole what the, this team can be, and quite honestly, what the whole league can be. And I so I'm I'm fascinated, and I, I have not had a chance to talk to a lot of my colleagues at, at other teams yet about how they're handling some of this. But I think one of the things that's going to be fascinating is what kind of hires are teams and the league going to make, and what kind of talent are they going to add right now to keep this kind of momentum going and go on the offensive a little bit. And I think you know one of the things that we all need to do is realize that we are in the entertainment business and we are going to have to, and, and you had a, you had a guest on recently who talked about players as content creators. Well, also the platforms themselves are content creators. So you're running out this just really unbelievably fragmented media landscape and it's harder and harder and harder than ever to earn people's time and attention because there's so many options, right? So for us to go on the offensive, what are we doing to go win in that content uh, and entertainment space? And I think, you know, so, so I think some of the things that teams need to do is, are they going to hire content experts to come in and not just push things out on social or promote things, but to actually produce content that goes out on a TikTok and competes and wins time and attention because it's great entertainment. And I think, you know, that's, that's true digital strategy. And I would, I think teams are going to have to start thinking, are we doing, are we hiring the digital strategists to do those pieces? And are we hiring the performance marketing people that, and the business intelligence people that can then use that interest that's generated by the digital side and capture it and, and start to take the people that have shown interest and move them along and make them fans, get them to games, turn them into long-term fans. Additionally, same thing, you know, are they, are we building up uh, more of the data collection, but also like, are we now looking at, the ticket sales game a little bit differently and, and what a ticket sales team looks like and, and how they connect into business intelligence and marketing and having all of those things work together. And then, like I said earlier, like, are we also growing valuable and, and then obviously fan experience? If you can, if you can do all that to get them to the game, what are we investing in the fan experience side to turn them into fans and make them come back on a repeated basis? And finally, you know, the part, the corporate partnership side of things, what are we doing? What assets are we creating? that are valuable for our partners and also allow us to continue to grow at this rate. And so it's, I think teams are going to, teams are going to be faced with some very interesting conversations about where they invest in the next couple of years to continue this, this growth. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated to see that, but I, I definitely have some strong opinions about where, where the options, where the best places to uh, place some of those resources are. Yeah. Well, um, it's been great to talk to you. It's been great to, to see the league grow the way that it has. And I'm sure that we're going to have a conversation maybe in a few months or in a year. And it's going to be interesting to see just how much growth that it's going to get at that point um, and even beyond that. So thanks for joining us, Dan. Um, this was uh, our episode of Front Office Sports today uh, featuring Dan Gad, the Atlanta Dream Senior Vice President for Growth. Thank you, Thank you Colin. It was great.